wearing only the stylish, most on-brand Carhartt overalls that I could find in one of my favorite places on the face of this earth, the calving barn, eager to go outside and check the next group of cows, are some of my very first fond memories of the challenging ranching lifestyle that I can recall. <laughs> it was a lot simpler times and simpler outfit choices, <laughs> all to grow up and mature a bit, and maybe I maybe took it for granted of how absolutely beautiful the grass was, clean the water was, and clear the skies were wherever my cows seemed to be grazing. But all to grow up and mature a bit and then to constantly hear about people discussing cattle's environmental impacts. I mean, when aren't Americans discussing what you should or shouldn't do? But present day, more than ever before, people are seeking environmentally more conscious products. And food manufacturers are capitalizing on this new environmental attention as a marketing strategy, whether there's truth in the different climate accusations or not. Now, more than ever before, meat eaters are being shamed for their eating habits. And cattle have now stepped into the crosshairs of this climate conversation. But their digestive processes, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon sequestration abilities, and soil benefits need to be better explained. In order for all consumers to understand that you can eat beef with not just a clear conscience, but a green one. Pinpointing where this new environmental criticism for the meat industry started is easier said than done. What has caused many global leaders or influencers to recommend us all forego meat in our diets just because we live in a first world country? Or like representatives to propose the destruction of the meat industry in her first draft of the New Green Deal? And what prompted a member of the Senate's Committee of Agriculture to say, I'm a vegan to fight climate change? The popularity of foregoing meat in our diets and cattle in our pastures in order to save the planet probably started with a 2006 report entitled Livestock's Long Shadow. That report blamed meat production for 18% of greenhouse gas emissions, with as much as 65% of those emissions coming from cattle production. I just am curious if some of these influencers and leaders might know that maybe choosing to forego a jetless lifestyle would save 1.6 tons of carbon from entering the atmosphere per transatlantic flight per passenger. And yet this study blamed animal agriculture for having a higher environmental impact than the entire transportation sector. So before we blame cows for our inevitable demise, let's take a more realistic look at the true effect of livestock production on our environment. Now, bovine flatulence has truly been blown out of proportion. <laughs> and you've probably all heard about cow farts depleting the ozone layer. But not only is the mainstream media assigning this guilt to the wrong end of the cow, but many may not realize that the digestive process of a cow is a grass-grazing wonder of science. So let's examine their ruminant stomachs. If you and I were to try and eat all that grass, we'd get little to no nutritional value, not to mention our super bad stomach aches. Cattle, on the other hand, have a vastly different digestive system that can convert these low-quality forages. Inside a chamber called a rumen, the fermentation of ingested biomass occurs with the help of these tiny microorganisms. These little gut bugs are what make the ruminant digestive system so much more efficient at pulling calories out of large amounts of forage better than any other digestive system known to man. Now, one of the byproducts of ruminant digestion is methane, which is burped and exhaled mostly. What some don't realize is even though this invisible gas can trap the sun's heat, it also breaks down naturally 10 times faster than any other greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. And get this, anything that decomposes emits methane, including uneaten, dead, and dying grasses. Yet when cattle consume and digest these forages, there are vastly more benefits than drawbacks. Surprisingly, the grazing of livestock can actually reverse this trend of carbon emission. When livestock graze on grasses and other forages, it forces those plants to stay in the growing cycle longer. The process of grazing makes photosynthesis happen faster and more frequently. Because of that, the higher the photosynthetic rates per acre, the more carbon is being sequestered or stored and put back into the soil. 
A study has shown a 1% increase in organic carbon within the top four inches of the soil's profile of grazed land. That is approximately the equivalent to 11 tons of carbon being sequestered per acre per year by raising cattle. And according to an ecologist, Alan Savory, the managing of livestock has the ability to take enough carbon out of our atmosphere to return us to pre-industrial levels. These natural cycles are how cattle are professional carbon sequesterers. They aren't our enemy in this attempt to manage the planet correctly. They very well could be one of the answers. Now, soil management or even soil regeneration is no easy feat. Yet the grazing of livestock has been a proven tool throughout history in resource conservation, soil improvement, and can even promote biodiversity. An exciting study reported in North Dakota actually directly compared ungrazed grasslands root systems versus grazed grasslands root systems. These results were pretty astonishing. The ungrazed grasslands root systems weighed in at 740 pounds per acre, while the grazed grasslands root systems weighed in at 2,400 pounds per acre. The heavier and more advanced the root systems are, the better the soil is at sequestering carbon, stopping erosion, and fighting drought. Yet within so many different conversations that I've had as a producer with consumers, I get asked some pretty interesting questions. One of those being is, well, aren't cattle on land that could be used to grow our food? Aren't grazing livestock just taking up way too much of agricultural land? Well, to better explain this, I think I need to use a few visuals for us to really understand what's going on on our global land use. So. If I were to take a simple piece of printer paper, do this with me, imagine that this is everything. This is the entire planet's surface. And then if I fold it into fourths, you'd actually be surprised to know that only 25% of the Earth's surface is actually solid land. So it's not ice or water. And then if I were to pull out a business card or a business-sized piece of paper, and that represents all the agricultural land that is available on this planet. Now, just because it's agricultural land doesn't mean that it can particularly grow a crop. So one third of all agricultural land is what we consider to be arable. That means that it can grow crops. That means that it has enough water, enough soil nutrients, and maybe doesn't have too many rocks so we can, we can grow crops on it. So that's one third is arable. The other two thirds is what we call marginal land. Maybe it doesn't have enough water or enough soil nutrients, and so what we have to do with it is put ruminant livestock on it so that they can upcycle inedible human foods into nutrient-dense proteins while also sequestering carbon. So if we were, as a society, to completely forego all animal agriculture, that would be throwing away two-thirds of all land that produces our food, not to mention throwing away 50% of all our fertilizer, so we have to take a closer look at how to truly be efficient with our land use in order to feed the most growing population and not throw away two-thirds of all agricultural land. And the next question that I often get is, well, Jonwin, what are ranchers doing, like you, to actually improve different soil benefits or be better for the planet? I love answering this because through new management practices, genetic indicators, and selection methods, ranchers are continually improving. And within the last 40 years, the United States has produced the same amount of beef with one-third fewer cattle. It would be my dream for every consumer to understand and regain trust with their producer because the fact of the matter is, agriculturalists, producers, and ranchers and farmers were the first environmentalists, and we care so deeply to be beneficial stewards of the land. Now, with all this new research concerning cattle, their soil improvement and carbon sequestration abilities, it's actually caused many experts to rethink their figures and become proponents of the benefits of animal agriculture. One of the leaders and leading mythbusters is Dr. Frank Mitliner, a professor at UC Davis and air quality specialist. He's actually proven to understand that that FAO 18% figure was entirely over-exaggerated. Subsequent figures have revealed that all beef production within the United States of America only accounts for 2.2% of total lifetime emissions. Yet this new figure hasn't reached the mainstream yet. 
But animal agriculture is progressive by nature. And left to our own ingenuity, cattle producers will continue to be a competitive natural carbon sink. But I have some challenges for you. If you consider yourself an agriculturalist, I need you to start asking yourself daily, what can I do better to communicate my progressive story? Now, I completely understand because that little girl in her overalls thought that it was a time-tested, obvious practice as to how cattle were produced in the United States of America. But our consumers have asked us a question, and it's time that we start answering their questions. To the next group of young agriculturalists, I'm so excited and absolutely honored that we have the challenge to feed this planet, heal the soil, and also celebrate it. We have the capability to do that, but before we can, we have to change our mindsets. I love when individuals call themselves an advocate of agriculture, but we need to change that mindset in order to make a better connection with our consumer and start to refer to ourselves as advocates of science. That's how you start to feed people. And lastly, if you simply eat food, I challenge and encourage you that the next time you walk into a grocery store, scan over a restaurant menu or see a pasture dotted with cattle, that you understand that beef is a part of the solution. And any meat alternative today looks to have a much harsher impact on our environment, health, and pocketbook than the good old one ingredient, nutrient-dense, carbon-storing beef.